Hello and welcome to our panel discussion, Makers and Takers, a Sensible Way to Debate the Role of Government. I'm Bob Wong, co-chair of the Center on Civility and De Democratic Engagement, uh, established by my class of 1968. Uh, we're located at the Goldman School of Public Policy. And this was, uh, our center was established as part of our, our 40th reunion GIF. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it up to Peter to tell you more about our center and uh, welcome you again and thanks for coming. Uh, everyone, there, there are seats up front here, so if you please uh, sit down and you don't have to stand for the entire uh, presentation. Um, I'm also a member of the class of 1968, as are a number of other um, individuals who are here. Uh, we are honored at the center to have, as the director of the center, Henry Brady, dean of the Goldman School, and as a distinguished senior fellow, Robert Reich. Now, the information is on the center, uh, on the center is on the materials that are at the doors at the back of the, uh, back of the room. The purpose of the center uh, is to encourage greater public participation in the democratic process and to foster civil discussion on important issues facing us. Now, among the things that the center does is it sponsors programs on relevant topics twice a year, one at homecoming and another here uh, at Cal Day. Now, I'd like to introduce uh, my fellow uh, Class 68 class member, my colleague on the advisory board for the center, uh, Dick Beers. Now, he has been a fierce advocate, trusted advisor, and philanthrop uh, philanthropist for the ca uh, campus, particularly the College of Natural Resources, where he's been on the advisory board for two decades. His lifelong passion for the environment is clear. Uh, Dick has re recently served on the UN Hunger Task Force as part of the Millennium Development Goals Initiative. Now, Dick's achievements and accolades are much too numerous for us to mention at this time, but I would just like everyone to please welcome Dick Beers. Thank you very much, and this is a wonderful turnout on a beautiful day, so it, it shows you, you recognize that we have a very distinguished panel today, and also, I think, a very interesting topic. Again, it's makers versus takers, a sensible way to debate the role of government. Uh, we have three distinguished panelists who I will introduce prior to their remarks, Henry Brady, C. Bell Fox, and Hillary Hoynes. And I think what, each person will speak for approximately 10 minutes, so we will have a, a good amount of time for give and take, because I think this is a topic which many people would like to express themselves. Uh, it's something that is at the top of uh, at the top of the news on a regular basis. So, but without further ado, I would like to introduce initially C. Bell Fox. She's an assistant professor of sociology here in Berkeley. Uh, she received a B.A. in history from U.C. San Diego and a Ph.D. from Harvard. And currently, her, her project is focusing on the politics of extending or withholding social welfare assistance to non-citizens from the New Deal to the present. So we're very fortunate to have C. Bell here to really give us an historic perspective on these issues. These are not something that are new to, uh, to America. C. Bell? Thank you very much. Um, like I, like uh, it was explained, I'm a historical so sociologist who writes about the safety net, especially uh, so far in the New Deal. And so I want to give a little bit of historical perspective on this debate. But before I do that, let's ask ourselves, who are the takers? So the takers, uh, by Mitt Romney's definition, the takers include anyone who doesn't pay federal income taxes, so roughly 47% of Americans. Paul Ryan's definition is a bit broader. He would include among the takers people who get more benefits from the federal government than they pay in federal taxes. Uh, by this definition, this includes somewhere between 60 and 70% of the American people. When pressed, some folks draw the boundaries a little bit more narrowly to ensure that veterans and those who rely on Social Security or Medicare are not included among the takers. So in this definition, the takers are folks who use anti-poverty programs, food stamps, unemployment insurance, and the like. Lastly, there's a real sense that uh, 
especially among members of the Tea Party, but also among others, that the takers are more prevalent among people of color and among immigrants, perhaps especially unauthorized immigrants. Now, being a so-called taker is problematic in this sort of worldview because using government assistance is presumed to lead to dependence, to victimhood, and to reduce individual initiative. So in Paul Ryan's words, we've turned the safety net into a hammock that lulls able-bodied people into lives of dependency and complacency. Now, while the language of the makers and the takers is new, many of the underlying ideas have a long history. Certainly, the idea that public and private charity could sap initiative is longstanding. In the 19th century, poor people who relied on government assistance, if they used outdoor relief or went to a poor house, for example, they would be called paupers. And being a pauper carried a stigma, signaling to the world one's vices and moral failings. Reverend Charles Burroughs, preaching at the opening of a new chapel in a poorhouse in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, admonished his audience, saying, pauperism is the consequence of willful error, of shameful indolence, of vicious habits. It is misery of human creation, the pernicious work of man, the lamentable consequence of bad principles and morals. As such, paupers were often treated as second-class citizens. They could be barred from voting, sometimes they could be rented out to the lowest bidder, and their names might be published in the newspaper to publicly shame them. America's immigrants were usually included among the undeserving, as they were thought by many to produce an unusual number of paupers. In the late 19th century, for example, many public charity officials believed that European governments, especially Britain and Ireland, were dumping paupers on US soil. Eugenists, the race scientists of the day, spent a lot of time trying to prove that various immigrants from Europe, especially those from Southern and Eastern Europe, the Italians, the Poles, the Jews, and others, that these people carried hereditary and cultural traits that made them especially likely to depend on relief. These ideas were picked up in the media and they were spread throughout the country. So in the 1920s, Kenneth Roberts, a future Pulitzer Prize winner, wrote a Saturday Evening Post uh, article in which he described these immigrants as the defeated, incompetent, and unsuccessful, the very lowest layer of European society. They are usually paupers by circumstance and too often parasites by training and inclination. They are expedited out of the countries by governments that do not want them, and they usually travel on money they have begged or demanded from America. Now, views about reliance on government assistance started to change a little bit in the early 20th century as progressive reformers discovered the structural and environmental causes of poverty. The hazardous working conditions, the low pay and insecure employment, uh, the poor housing stock and sanitation in urban America, that these things undermine the health and well-being of the city's inhabitants, as well as the difficulties immigrants faced in, in adapting to immigrant life. These reformers tried to frame public and private assistance as necessary in modern industrial urban America. For the vast majority of Americans, though, the use of government assistance continued to carry a heavy stigma. Now, it wasn't until the Great Depression that average Americans' ideas about government assistance started to be transformed in some important ways. The stunning failure of the private sector to provide jobs and to protect people's savings, and the failure of local public and private charities to provide a modicum of support um, for the young, for the old, and for the 25 percent of the American people who were unemployed. All these things led to a reevaluation of the role of the federal government in American life. After three long years of brutal deprivation and economic decline under Herbert Hoover, the people demanded that the federal government intervene, and they elected Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, on his promise to do so. Now, within the first two years, FDR's administration provided states and local governments with billions of dollars for emergency cash relief, as well as public work programs to put people back to work and to sustain those for whom no work was available. Now, federal intervention did not go unchallenged. From the left, there was a chorus of voices that argued that the policies just did not go far enough. The New Deal programs were nowhere near as generous or as inclusive as they should be. 
The interventions in the economy were too friendly toward business. From the right, conservatives railed against what they saw as creeping socialism, the loss of freedom, and against the pampering of the poor at the expense of hardworking, tax-paying Americans. So one man wrote to the president decrying his administration as the most inequitable this country has ever known. You pamper poverty and throttle thrift. The industrious, the frugal, efficient are penalized to promote sloth, waste, and incompetence. It is all wrong, unfair, unnatural. Your administration has coddled those whom it was politically expedient to conciliate and impose upon those who, like myself, are politically unorganized, although we probably pay more taxes in the aggregate and have a greater stake in the country than any other class. Now, FDR uh, agreed with his critics on the right in at least one way. In his annual message to Congress in 1935, he famously said that the lessons of history show conclusively that continued dependence upon relief induces a spiritual and moral disintegration fundamentally destructive to the national fiber. To dole out relief in this way is to administer a narcotic, a subtle destroyer of the human spirit. It is inimical to the dictates of sound policy. It is a violation of the traditions of America. But his message to Congress did not represent a turning away from a belief in the value of federal assistance. He was talking about cash relief for able-bodied persons. The same year that he made this statement, he expanded the reach of the federal government significantly when he signed the Social Security Act. The Social Security Act created social insurance programs like Social Security and unemployment insurance. But it also created means-tested public assistance programs for people who were poor and thought to be unemployable, including the elderly, the blind, as well as women with children. For those who were deemed employable, FDR created a massive federal jobs program called the Works Progress Administration. And within a year, the WPA was already employing 3 million people. It helped to create uh, the build the nation's roads, uh, bridges, schools, post offices, state and national parks, and airport runways. Now, were these men and women who built the nation's infrastructure, who created the nation's parks, or the women who raised American citizens with the help of the government, or the elderly who toiled throughout their lives but needed help in old age takers and makers? FDR would have chafed at that distinction. For FDR, the real destroyer of the human spirit was not assistance from the government, it was unemployment. He said, to those who say that our expenditures for public works and others uh, means for recovery are a waste that we cannot afford, I answer that no country, however rich, can afford to waste uh, of its human resources. Demoralization <coughs> caused by vast unemployment is our greatest extravagance. Morally, it is the greatest menace to our social order. And so when the private sector failed to provide jobs, FDR believed that it was the government's responsibility to intervene. Now, the, while the vast majority of Americans uh, agreed with him as well, uh, only about 10 to 20 percent of American citizens supported cash relief, but over 80 percent uh, supported work relief. And America's business leaders agreed as well. Now, the public that should Americans uh, extend relief to non-citizens? The public response to that question was a resounding no. Rumors circulated in the press that uh, a million or more aliens on relief existed and that non-citizens were getting preference for WPA jobs when American citizens and uh, veterans went without. Now, both authorized and unauthorized immigrants were targeted. This is a cartoon on the front page of the Chicago Tribune the same year the Social Security Acts pass. And the bottom row says, many idle aliens who entered this country illegally are on the dole, while American taxpayers must work to support them. National public opinion polls at the time found that more than two-thirds of Americans did not believe non-citizens should receive relief. Now, given this anti-immigrant sentiment, did non-citizens, even those who were in the country illegally, get access to New Deal programs? If they were European immigrants, they did. Uh, there were no federal citizenship or legal status restrictions for Social Security and unemployment insurance, and none for aid to dependent children or any of the other federal programs. This was true in 1935, and it was true all the way until the 1970s. Now, 
Public mistrust of welfare recipients or of individuals who are presumed to be not working has remained high throughout the 20th century. During the 1960s and 1970s, these attitudes were, as you can see here, incredibly pervasive. Since the 1960s, attitudes and discussions about welfare have also become racially coded in a, some new and some old ways. Think of Ronald Reagan's welfare queen, a gross caricature of a woman he deployed unrelentingly on his campaign trail for the 1976 presidential election. Most people, as a result, now assume that uh, welfare recipients are black and that they believe that this group is especially undeserving of assistance. And despite the fact that virtually all unauthorized immigrants have been barred from virtually all federal programs since the 1970s, stereotypes about their alleged oops, overuse of relief persist. Sorry about that. Just leave it, let's see. Sorry. F5. F5. Let's see here. Anyway. <laughs> so as you can see, this is just my last slide. In conclusion. As you can see, while the language has changed, many of these ideas are not new. If there's a difference, it's that the so-called takers of the past were more narrowly delimited. They were usually cast as able-bodied individuals, usually men uh, or unmarried mothers, often immigrants, people of color, who were presumed not to work in the formal labor market. Since we ended welfare as we know it in 1996, putting lifetime limits on assistance, cutting off many legal immigrants, uh, implementing tough sanctions and work requirements, the welfare roles have declined dramatically. And the vast majority of people who now rely on assistance work. Um, but rather than abandon the vilification of those who rely on government assistance, the targets of this disparagement have simply widened up to 60, maybe 70% of the American population to include anyone who benefits from government programs, no matter their past, present, or future contributions to the labor force, to the economy, and to the nation. Now, whether Americans buy into these distinctions of makers and takers, I'll let, leave that for, my next, for the next speaker to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Seabell. You've given us a great context to consider all of these issues. I think it's pretty obvious from Sibel's remarks that there are some real issues here of perception versus reality. Uh, our next speaker, Henry Brady, is the dean of the Goldman School and class of 1941 Monroe Deutsch Professor of Political Science and Public Policy here in Berkeley. Uh, I want to apologize to all the speakers. I'm giving very truncated pre uh, introductions in the interest of time, but you do have more detailed bios that you were given on flyers. So, uh, uh, I think their distinction is obvious from their comments. Uh, Henry has also been the president of the Political Methodology Society of the American Political Science Association and was director of the University of California's Survey Research Center for over a decade, from 1998 to 2009. Henry is going to focus on public opinion and kind of where we are today. Thank you. So while we get this up, I'll ask the technical guy to do that. A quick story. I saw the Civilian Conservation Corps advertisement up there. When I was a graduate student at MIT, I used to work late in the library, and every night I would uh, talk with a, an older man who was the janitor. Johnny is how I knew him. And we got to be friends, and one day he came in and he said, you've got to see my scrapbook. And one of the noticeable things about Johnny was he had a, a hand that was withered, and uh, he had been disabled all his life. And he showed me this this book he had of pictures from his uh, involvement with the Civilian Conservation Corps. And he told me the story about how he had been a poor kid in the North End in Boston, an Italian kid. Uh, he had a withered hand. He thought he was useless. When the Depression came, he felt he was more useless because he couldn't help his mother. And then along came the Civilian Conservation Corps and got him involved. He went off uh, far somewhere in the West, and I don't remember where, and the pictures were all about this. 
and he just was so thrilled to show me this notebook that showed all these pictures of him doing things through the Civilian Conservation Corps, and he said to me, that proved to me I could be a useful person. I could help my mother. I could send money back every week to my mother. And that's just one of the many stories about the Civilian Conservation Corps and the kinds of things that FDR did during the Depression. Uh, I want to talk about, as Dick said, um, sort of the public opinion. Uh, here's the quotation from Mitt Romney taken off that famous or infamous tape. There are 47% who are with him, him being Barack Obama, who are dependent, and I've added emphasis here, upon government, who believe they are victims, who believe that government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. The 47%, as Sibel said, comes from the statistics that 47% uh, of Americans uh, don't pay federal income tax. Um, uh, actually, I've got it wrong here, that 47% that, uh, of Americans do not pay federal income tax, um, but close enough. Uh, so, uh, 47, the claims are these, and it's actually quite an extraordinary piece of rhetoric, by the way, and it appeals to a very conservative group of people within the Republican Party, certainly the Tea Party. Uh, the claims are 47% of Americans think they're victims. They believe government has a responsibility to care for them. They believe they're entitled to government benefits. And furthermore, because they first thought they were victims and now they think they're entitled, they've become dependent upon government. So you have this terrible notion of people who are just feel themselves victimized, feel themselves entitled, and feel themselves, and have, who have therefore become dependent and can't get off the dole. Are they victims? I'm just going to look at some public opinion data. So first, you wouldn't imagine that a victim would think that the free enterprise economy is a good idea. They would think, well, government should do everything. Well, but the truth is 64% believe government should stay out of the way, that the free enterprise society is the way to go. That doesn't leave 47%. That leaves 36% at most. Um, do Americans believe there is opportunity? Two-thirds of Americans believe there's plenty of opportunity, and then you could add in the 18% who disagree somewhat, because you could imagine that people could legitimately think that, in fact, there's not quite as much opportunity as they wish there was, and it doesn't mean they're rejecting the system particularly. Um, but here's where Americans do disagree uh, with Mitt Romney, I think, um, and they believe that the government should work to substantially reduce the income gap between rich and poor. 62% think that the distribution of income is not fair. So, what can we conclude from this? Most Americans do not see themselves as victims. And by the way, if you ask them whether they think of themselves as victims, which is sort of a too cheap a test, they don't, they don't say they are. <laughs> Big surprise. Uh, but they do think income inequality is unfair. Hence, you can only say they believe they're victims, it seems to me, if we equate that with believing income inequality is unfair. But it strikes me that you can believe income inequality is unfair without being uh, thinking of yourself as a victim. So victims doesn't seem like the public opinion data support that. And there's lots of other data I could, could cite. Do they believe themselves entitled? Well, entitled people would believe we should increase taxes, spend a lot more, and help them solve their problems by giving them tons of money. So what's true in America with respect to taxes? Do Americans automatically support new taxes? 79% of the people in this particular survey do not favor raising taxes to solve the problem of the deficit. So even for that, that purpose. So they're either opposed or, or in the sort of don't know or neither column. Uh, do Americans automatically support more spending? You would certainly expect if they 47% think they're entitled that we'd get at least 47% who say we should have more spending. But 61% do not favor increased spending, and this is from a 2012 study. So, and notice, this is a pretty tough question. It really tries to give you the trade-offs here. Should government provide fewer services in order to reduce spending? Uh, others feel it's important to provide more services even if it means increases in spending. What do you think? And we find 61% do not favor increased spending. So it's not like there's a large number of people out there who really believe that we should tax a lot more and spend a lot more. Uh, and then furthermore, and I think this is the most probative piece of data here, when laid off, who do Americans think should help them? 
Well, if 47% feel entitled, they should think the government should step in to give them a job. But in fact, workers, uh, people who were asked this question, when people are laid off from work, who should be mainly responsible for helping them? Most people say the workers themselves. That's all those green bars. And I'm going to talk about the subcategories in just a moment. But the total is on the left. So the green bars, they really think it's the individual. Then employers, and down at the bottom comes government. That's so not like they think they are entitled to have government help them. Now, the only group for whom that's not quite true is the unemployed looking for work. That's not a complete surprise that if you're unemployed, you might think the government should step in and help you. Uh, furthermore, if you just ask the question straight out, should government help provide jobs, should government see to jobs and a good standard of living for everyone, or should it let each person get ahead on his or her own, 61% don't think government responsible, but it is true that 39% say that government should see to jobs. But notice, this is a pretty weak question. It's basically saying, should government help in this area? The slide before says that Americans don't think government's the only entity that's responsible. They think individuals themselves are responsible, primarily then employers, and then last on that list was government. So Americans do think government should help, but they don't necessarily think that it should be the primary helper in trying to get people jobs. So what are their conclusions here? Most Americans don't think that taxes and spending, that taxes should be decreased, should, that taxes should be increased and spending should be increased to care for them. They also believe the individual has the greatest responsibility for dealing with layoffs. But they do believe government should help. Hence, Romney's claim only holds water if we believe that thinking government should help the unemployed is believing that government has a responsibility to care for them to court entirely. And that's not what the data shows. Dependent, do people actually think of themselves as dependent? And are they dependent? Uh, this is looking at some data that I'm sure Hillary in a moment is going to, I think, do this much better than I'm about to do it. This is just some data that shows uh, using the uh, 2010 or 2011 current population survey March supplement. This is the same survey that's uh, used to get unemployment data. And it looks at the work and benefit status of those 15 and older on the survey. And 63% worked. 12.4% uh, worked but didn't get benefits, and 25% did not work but received benefits. Okay, so that might be halfway towards the 47%. Uh, these are benefits like food stamps or like Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid, things like that. But then let's look at that 24.7 or 25%. Half of them are retired, one-fifth are disabled, one-eighth are in school. And I would suggest that all of those people have legitimate reasons uh, not to be working and perhaps to get government aid. Uh, and that leaves only a total of 5% in this particular analysis who you could argue are dependent. Now, what might be going on here? Well, a really interesting book was published recently called The Submerged State. And in this book, Suzanne Mettler went and asked people, do you get government benefits? And in her 2008 survey, 57% of Americans said they had never gotten a benefit program. Okay? Later in the survey, however, she asked them about specific programs. And this is what she found, that of that 57%, 60% got the home mortgage deduction, 53% had gotten a student loan, 47% an earned income tax credit, 44% Social Security, on and on, you can see. And by the way, there's a long list she has. She's got actually 19 programs. I just took some of the top ones and the most uh, well-known programs. So the truth is, a lot of Americans do get government benefits. It's hard to believe they are dependent upon them because it turns out they actually don't really quite realize they're getting government benefits. Um, they do think that others are getting benefits, and they're sometimes upset about that, certainly welfare recipients. But it turns out they themselves are, in fact, getting benefits. So one of the perplexities of this whole area, and it really is encapsulated in the famous comment, uh, keep government's hands off my Medicare, the famous comment where somebody said, let's make sure government doesn't get involved with Medicare. Uh, well, of course, government provides Medicare. Uh, so that comment showed 
exactly this thesis that, in fact, a lot of people get benefits, don't even realize they're government benefits, and they criticize others because supposedly those other people are getting benefits when they themselves are getting benefits. So in the end, I would argue Americans are not really dependent, but they get a lot of benefits from the state, which they don't even realize are from the state. So that here's my conclusions. Uh, beliefs that taxes are unfair does not constitute victimhood. Beliefs that government should help do not constitute a feeling of entitlement. In fact, the facts do not support dependency. And let me just end with two comments by conservative commentators who have criticized the makers-takers dichotomy and argued that it's not the right route for the Republican Party to follow. David Brooks saying, gee, maybe government can be helpful sometimes and the Republican Party should not turn its back on the notion that government could sometimes help solve problems. And Scott Rusmussen, who runs a polling firm but is also a conservative commentator, recently wrote something where he said, let's get off this. It's not really a productive way to move forward. Thanks. Thank you very much. Our, our final speaker is Hilary Hoynes, a professor of public policy and economics at UC Davis. And she's going to be joining the Goldman School on July 1st. Well, she'll have an appointment as an, uh, in the economics department and hold the Haas Distinguished Chair in Economic Disparities. I think we owe her a, a welcome. <laughs> so it's great, great to have you here. Uh, her recent work has been widely published, and she is a co-editor of the leading journal in economics, the American Economic Review. And she's going to uh, focus on the facts. Where are we in reality today? Just the facts. <laughs> well, but Dick didn't say, and uh, you know, you, you'll all be excited that I'm joining here. Uh, the, here at the campus this summer. What he didn't say is I did get my PhD down the road a little ways at Stanford, so I hope you won't hold that against me, but you will see it in my bio, so I figured I'd just get that over with uh, while my, I think mine's the PDF. I'm not sure. The applause sure. wouldn't have been as loud. If right, I, you know, I knew you were being selective, but you know, I'm all about the facts, <laughs> so I want to make sure that, uh, that we start with that. Um, at wind uh, review, which I wasn't sure what she wanted. Uh, sorry, not view. This one. Yeah, full screen. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's wonderful to be part of this group um, and to have such uh, complimentary uh, comments to be brought together on this issue. So um, I decided to arrange my comments here. I'm all about the data. I love data, facts, figures. Uh, my children sometimes get a little annoyed when I answer questions with a graph. Their mom, can you just tell me? Why do you have to show me that? Uh, but I'm all about showing the facts. So I thought I would organize my comments today around um, four myths. Uh, so myth number one, what, me? I'm not a taker. Um, so there's some overlap here with some of the comments that, that Henry and uh, uh, Sibel also made. So just to cover some of the ground that's already been covered uh, in framing these ideas, there's, of course, much attention to uh, what people's understanding and perceptions of who takers are. And I think probably the most common definition is a relatively narrow one uh, that is about access to the anti-poverty programs and the safety net for low-income families. And so the two most important pieces of that safety net in the United States are the food stamp program, the earned income tax credit, and historically important but much less important today is kind of welfare, cash welfare for families with children. To give you some perspective on those three programs, which are very important, the, the figure uh, that's up there right now uh, gives you an idea about all of the spending on um, programs, let me just get that out, out of there, there we go, uh, for low income families and disabled and elderly. So all the sort of low income programs in the United States. And the ones that are circled in red are the three most important for low income families um, in the United States. And I'm gonna sort of come back to that at the very end of my comments. But the point of showing you this is to really put in perspective that 
on the basis of spending and dollars, by far the elephant in the room is healthcare spending. So in the top end of that graph is the Medicaid program, which is a health insurance program for low-income families with children, disabled, elderly, um, less elderly because uh, Medicare is the primary health insurance program uh, through the federal government uh, for the elderly. So that, that's observation one. What other kinds of programs might fit into this framework of thinking about takers? Social Security, Medicare, disability, unemployment has already been measured, uh, mentioned. So what we know is that virtually all Americans uh, receive Social Security and Medicare uh, once they reach uh, age 65. So from that perspective, the question is, are we all takers? Um, so in order to put in perspective somewhat the incredible importance of these programs, Social Security, Medicare, and so on, compared to the anti-poverty programs that I started with, here is just a very uh, crude um, uh, description of spending by the federal government. And so what you can see is in the top pie, um, uh, the largest categories are Social Security in the sort of light orange, defense in the darker orange, um, and so on, and the uh, health programs in the sort of lightest orange color on the bottom. So the safety net programs, the 11%, might be the sort of narrow definition of takers and anti-poverty programs, and I think it's useful to sort of put that in the perspective of these other, you know, what I'm going to argue and where my comments are going to end, I'm going to argue are very centrally important programs for Americans' well-being, uh, uh, in particular thinking about what Social Security does. So this is meant to just provide some pr uh, perspective on, you know, who takers are, what these programs are, and how do they figure into the, to the federal budget. I could not uh, resist what Henry also couldn't resist, the hands off my Medicare. I mean, to me, this was really a low point. And I complained, and my husband said, Hillary, this is why you need to write those op-eds. And that's what he always says when I complain about something and misunderstanding in the public. And I, and I, you know, we're all doing what we can. So one thing I did want to mention about the hands off my Medicare, which I'm sure all of you in this room know that Medicare is a federal program. But an interesting piece about that, and this is something that most people don't know, and is structurally part of the way the program has been since its introduction in 1965, is that Medicare is not fully paid for by the payroll taxes that we all pay uh, when we're working. And m many people would logically think that was so. Uh, because we can see on our paycheck where we've got the deductions for Social Security and where we get the deductions for Medicare. And those can be quite large contributions each month. Well, what you can see just focusing on the bar on the left, uh, only 40% of Medicare spending in, this is 2012, is actually paid for by payroll taxes. So it is a program that is very largely based on general taxes. And that is why it's so important and is a big part of the deficit reduction conversation because it's not uh, fully paid for by the current payroll system. And it never has been. This is not a new phenomenon having to do with rising health care costs. It was the way the program was structured from the beginning, which is just kind of interesting and just an important thing to know. Um, so myth number two, takers equal dependency. And I just, you know, Henry's already mentioned some things about this. I just wanted to mention a few more. So again, in this very narrowest definition of takers focusing on uh, programs that are uh, primarily available for low-income families, uh, two very important things have happened in the last 15 years that have completely changed the landscape of assistance for low-income families with children. Number one, we reformed welfare. It's pretty much gone. Um, the amount of spending on welfare has been cut by about uh, down to 25% of what it was uh, at its peak uh, in the um, mid-1990s. So it's gone. What has replaced it is the expansion of an earnings subsidy that operates through the tax system, which is the primary reason why low-income families with children don't pay federal income taxes is structurally because we're providing subsidies to these individuals through the tax system. 
The tax system is sort of a nice way to do this because it's very efficient from the standpoint of not having to have welfare offices and evaluate people's earnings. But centrally, the point I want to make here is that the reform of welfare and the expansion of the earned income tax credit have all been very much towards the decision to redistribute income to low-income families while promoting employment. And so the net result of that is that the employment rates of less skilled women with children have increased by about 10 percentage points, decreased some in the current recession. And this has very much been documented as being directly related to this change in the nature of redistribution policy for low-income families with children. Americans are much more interested, if you look at the opinion data, in supporting the poor if they're helping themselves rather than helping people not be in the labor market. And that's precisely what's taken place between about the mid-1990s and 2010. Um, so I don't think there's a lot of evidence that that's dependency. Um, it, it is worth having a conversation about the role of disability programs in the United States, and I'll just sort of leave it at that. Um, anyone who heard the amazing This American Life episode a few weeks ago all about disability it was super interesting. Um, something we might want to think about. Myth number three, um, the 47 percent are takers. Um, so this is the quote that Henry had in his uh, comments. So let's just take a look at who that 47 percent are that do not owe federal income taxes. That's that, what that means. So what you can see here is the biggest category, 61 percent, are individuals who pay quite a lot in taxes but not necessarily in federal income taxes. Uh, these would be individuals who are paying payroll taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, state taxes, not federal income taxes. And one of the reasons for that is having um, low income and being uh, some fraction of this, being eligible for the earned income tax credit. Uh, about a quarter of that 47% are elderly who uh, are on Social Security primarily, maybe some asset income, and don't owe any federal income taxes. Uh, the remainder, about 17%, are individuals who are currently not working, have disabilities, are on other kinds of aid. So it's a perspective on who that 47% is. Um, and while I'm talking about taxes, I simply could not resist showing this amazing work that Emmanuel Saez here up the, up the hill in the economics department uh, here at Cal has been doing about documenting inequality in the United States and, and around the world. I'll just show you one picture from that about the US. So what this gives you is throughout the entire history of the federal income tax system, which was introduced uh, to pay for World War I uh, back in the day, what this graph gives you, the black line tells you what share of all income earned in the United States is earned by the top 1% of Americans. I think he's largely responsible for the 99%, 1% sort of dichotomy that the um, Occupy movement took on. It's amazing um, public policy and information. So that's the, the black line. And the red dashed line is the marginal tax rate what that means is uh, for additional dollar in income, how much, do you, uh, how much would you be facing in uh, federal taxes at the top income tax bracket? And so what this shows you, this is not, you know, I'd be the first to say correlation is not causation, um, but what the correlation shows you anyways is that in, since the mid-1970s, the incredible growth in inequality in the United States as here just shown by the top 1%, and the relationship between that and the tax burden of the highest uh, earning Americans. So there's a lot of work on this. I think there is very strong evidence that the tax system is, to some extent, contributes to what appears to just be a correlation here. But it's an, it's an important perspective to step back and think about this maker versus taker kind of setting, I think. So last. And I want to, you know, I'm a glass half full kind of person. Just, that's just the way I am. I want to end with something positive. So myth number four, the taking doesn't help. So I, you know, I've spent my career basically trying to figure out what programs do, how they affect family uh, well-being, how do children fare when there's more or less assistance or more or less income in the household and so on. I just want to show you one fact. 
So the idea is to take poverty, uh, that's the share of Americans that have income below a given line that is meant to be a sort of basic standard of living. Uh, and that number right now is about 12% of Americans, much higher among children, about 20% of Americans. And what we want to do is um, imagine one at a time taking away various elements of the safety net, or the reverse is actually the data I'm going to show you, is one at a time adding in an element to the safety net and saying how does that affect poverty in a kind of snapshot way. So here's the answer. It turns out the biggest anti-poverty program in America may surprise you. It's Social Security. So the way to read this graph is if you take all persons in the United States as a whole, the fact that Social Security exists reduces the poverty rate by eight percentage points. That's what the eight is. So that's big. Uh, the next most important anti-poverty program in the United States is the Earned Income Tax Credit. And for children, just maybe a group we, we care a fair amount about, it turns out that that's the biggest anti-poverty program for children or families with children, uh, how you might want to define it. So it's about f 4 million, uh, 5 million children who are removed from poverty due to the earned income tax credit, this in-work-based earnings assistance program that I told you about. I have a question about what you mean. You say a reduction of 8.3 percent. Percentage points. Oh, okay. Percentage points. So off a base of, I forget what the base is here. I think the base is 15. So it's a big, Social Security is huge. Very, very large. Um, so this just gives you an idea of how important these programs are. It's just one measure of what the safety net does. So in conclusion, perhaps at best, the makers versus takers is just wrong. At worst, or I don't know, at worst it's not constructive. That's no, it's, at worst it's much worse than that. But it's certainly not very constructive. Um, I think it's quite reasonable and important for Americans to have a discussion about what we want to have as part of our government. Uh, but it seems to me that what we want is clear and effective data to talk about what these programs actually do and how people are affected. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And because our speakers were so respectful of everyone's time, we actually do have a substantial amount for give and take and questions and the like. Uh, our speakers are going to be mic'd for sound, and so you can be formulating your questions right now. I am going to take the liberty, however, of asking a question myself. I think one of the things, uh, I, I, th I kept thinking of the movie Apollo 13, where they, they're, everything's going awry in space and they say, uh, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, I think we have a problem here, clearly, of where uh, the facts are not necessarily being presented to the public in a very, very meaningful way. And so accordingly, we, and I was a television executive myself for 25 years, so I think I have a free hand of condemning the press in a lot of ways. And I, I think one of the things we have a real problem with is what I would characterize as false equivalency. So for example, if you're going to talk about climate change, the media feels 50% of the time goes to people that believe in climate change and 50% of the time goes to those that don't. Well, reality, climate change is proven science. It is, it is happening. So from my perspective, 98% of the time should be allocated to the people concerned about climate change and 2% that aren't. So, I think we face a lot of the same kind of issues here, and I'd like to ask the panelists just, I guess in a sense, what do we do about this? In the sense, let's take, as if, uh, if this is a reality here, that the facts are not being pursued. What's the price we pay, and how do you feel it can be changed? Anyone, please feel free well, to. Well, let me just say that uh, clearly the makers takers phrase and the victims, the entitled, the dependent, those phrases work for Republicans with their base. And so one of the problems we face is that we have a party that gets a lot of mileage out of making those claims. And so the facts are really not of much use from their perspective because all it will do will cut into their support. 
I think each and every one of us kind of does what, does what we can in order to try to speak the truth. Um, and I think in the, you know, the three of us and our jobs and our perspectives as uh, intellectuals and scholars, you know, we, we do what we can on that. But I think we all need to step outside our office sometime and make sure that we're talking to the world about this information. So I, probably the most people I reach is I, I teach every year a, 400 students an introduction to a microeconomics. And that's probably my biggest audience most of the time. And I try not to forget that. Um, but anyways. OK, yeah. we'd like to now open, uh, no, no. No. Okay. Uh, I'd like to open the uh, floor to questions in the back. Oh, you've never, you've never read the book, uh, The Year Without a Summer, right? No, that's correct. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll, I'll take that challenge. Uh, there, I think the, I'll, I'll, go to, I'll quote Inez Fung, who's a climate scientist at Berkeley. Uh, what, actually, she... Okay, what are they, is that nuclear power engineer or something, trying to promote it to nuclear power business? Is that banking industry that supports all that carbon? Okay, well... Uh, I. I don't know. She's a climate scientist. I don't know if you'd. Uh, yeah, yeah. Ines Fung is a woman. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is a separate topic. I'd be glad to stay and 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 discuss it with you. And on that, that's an interesting point, though, on the question of data versus dogma. The reality is, I remember asking Inez, but hey, we're losing the. Uh, the snow on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. And she, her point is, I will show you precisely when the snows will be gone from Kilimanjaro based on the fact of what's happening. But that's another discussion for later. So the question was, many people say that the, the, the system is such that it's cheaper or more advantageous from an income perspective to be on welfare than to work minimum wage, which is just false. I mean, it, it is just, it's, you know, maybe there was a day and a time and uh, possibly in some states and in some situations, but in general, the U.S. does not have a very generous uh, program for people who are, who are out of work. Um, on a kind of permanent basis. Really, we very much do not. Um, so there's a very kind of eked out safety net at this point, which is, I, th I would argue, keeping a lot of people out of extreme poverty, uh, but, it, but it's, not a, 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 it's not a winning strategy. Um, there's also time limits for adults right now. Right. You can't stay on welfare forever. Two these years. Days. Two years. Two years. Now, it is true that the children can sometimes maintain their welfare payments. Uh, even though the adults can't get the money. But still, it's, they're not that generous, as Hillary said. Yeah, the welfare so benefits are, in some states, $300 a month for a family of three. I mean, they, they can be unbelievably low. And if you think that, it's, you know, that work pays that little, um, that's Well, the minimum right. wage right now is, help me, uh, roughly $10? No. It's seven, not even that high. Well, well let's make it $10, because that's easy. Yeah, that's 20000 a year. Right. Uh, for 2,000 hours, so uh, clearly you'd be better off going to get minimum wage. So let's say it's 15,000. So take, with the EITC, then another $3,000 kicked in. And then so the EITC helps, helps you as well. Gives That's you the whole idea: is it's providing, it's raising that bar um, right. in the in work kind okay. of choice. Okay, the gentleman in the blue shirt, then the one on the green, and then I'll take a couple on this side. You're no, you're first. Oh. You. Oh, okay. Oh. Maybe I'm colorblind. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, I just had a quick question about the earned income tax credit. I wanted to see if you had any ideas about what the best idea was to, to change that. I mean, I feel like we are sort of shifting to where we are providing social assistance through the tax cut. It doesn't seem like a very good idea. It doesn't seem like a good policy idea. What do you think the, what do you think the, thing, the, the next move to make in terms of getting that system reversed is? So why, I'm just curious why you don't think, I mean, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but just so I understand where you're coming from, why do you think it's not a good idea? Uh, it seems 
like a very hidden part of social insurance. Mm. I understand. I understand why it's done that way, mm -hmm. but it seems like if we want to really quantitatively look at where we're delivering benefits, it seems as if we it's sort of a forgotten. It's it's a derivative almost. It's sort of forgotten in another balance sheet somewhere. Right. I think you, you know you're probably right about that. I used to call it the stealth social insurance program, which I thought was sort of a positive thing because I figured if it was really obvious, it'd get cut. Um, uh, but that's that's myself as a as a voter, not as a uh, as a scholar. Um, I, I think it started that way. I mean, just a little bit of a perspective on the earned income tax credit. The reason why it started inside the federal income tax is its original uh, construct was to offset payroll taxes for low-income individuals. So the idea was mm -hmm. these real low-income guys earning the minimum wage were having to pay a quite large share of their income as a share of their income in payroll taxes, and that was, could we kind of help them out a little bit? And so the reason why it started the way it did through the tax system was because of that sort of simple offset idea within the tax system. And then, you know, and then in uh, the thought of using it as a earning subsidy program, the view was, well, this is the efficient way to do it. We've got all the information, the W-2 information. It really does reduce the administrative costs. And it gives a real incentive for people to go to work. And, and by the way, right. for, for employers who want to get low income uh, workers, it actually helps subsidize them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It allows them to get labor at a lower cost. You know, one thing I can't help in, but interjecting here, there's been reference a great deal to payroll taxes. Right. And I thought when we had this, the, you know, the debate about taxing the rich and all that kind of thing, to show you where I felt the press framed the issue incorrectly. Everything was about we're going to tax the wealthy, we're going to tax the wealthy. And then it's almost like a throwaway line. Yeah, and payroll taxes are going up 2%. Payroll taxes went up 50%. When you go from 4% to 6 you're talking about that 60% that are paying payroll taxes. Their tax bill is going up 50%. So it's a way it can be, it can be framed in different ways. Gentleman in the green shirt. Yeah. Right. So as I showed, the break-even quota on Medicare. Oh, sorry. The question was, um, who were the winners and losers? I'll just reframe it. I'll make it sexy. Who were the winners and losers in Social Security and Medicare? Is anybody? Is everybody in the black and the red? Who? Who is a net payer or a net recipient of um, Social Security and Medicare? The other stealth, I'm just going to tell you the dirty little secret, the other stealth social uh, insurance program, redistribution program in the United States, Social Security. Um, so the, what we call the replacement mm -hmm. rate, so as a share of your sort of averaged earnings over your lifetime that's replaced by Social Security in retirement is highly progressive. So it provides much more assistance on the dollar uh, for lower income individuals and higher income individuals. That was the original construct. Now the, the taxes are also, as you, Dick, mentioned, uh, also uh, redistributive, which is the opposite. On net, it's a highly progressive program. Uh, so generally, if you're either a single earner household, traditional, just one earner over your lifetime um, among uh, married couples, you're more likely to be a net winner versus a two earner family, or if you have lower earnings. Medicare, everybody's a loser. I, or, or I should say, um, everybody's, a, everybody's, everybody's a winner. <laughs> sorry, we're all losers, but sorry. Let Short me say that again. Work. No, very few people uh, pay as much in payroll taxes as they receive in Medicare benefits. And like I said, that was the, just the original setup of the program, which I don't really understand the history behind that, but I need to do my... Well, look from your slide, too, that it was partly as the new parts were added, they were right. funded less and less with right. the original payroll Especially taxes. prescription, the prescription the, drug the, Part the, the D. George W. Bush right. prescription was unfunded. We've got a couple of questions on this side. Are there... Oh, right here, we'll go with you. Hi. Um, is, the, is the correlation between the rise of income and wealth in the 1%, is that connected with the depletion of public resources? Cities and states are going broke. I have not seen any work on that. I think that the, the myriad of explanations for the increase in inequality kind of come down to three things, mm -hmm. I think, as I understand it. Um, globalization, the rising, the return to skill, 
uh, in the economy and taxes. Right. I was going to say it's the second the, one that you could argue that because states and localities do not fund K through 12 and higher education the way they used to, that means we're putting less investment in people getting higher education, which means in the long run those folks will have lower incomes than they might otherwise have, and that increases inequality. So Agreed. indirectly, I think the answer is yes through that second mechanism. Uh, yes. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Just wanted to ask uh, about Obamacare. It occurs to me that perhaps um, socialized medicine, as you will, um, actually helps uh, free enterprises. Uh, I'm thinking like Starbucks. Uh, it's hard to compete against Starbucks for benefits if you're a small, you know, say coffee house. And if you have a level playing field, perhaps that would, uh, you know, enable a small enterprise to compete successfully with a, a larger one. What are your thoughts on that? You know, I've heard the argument many times that this is an element not only of competition between the Starbucks and the cafe, as you well, you know, illustrate, but also America versus their, competi their competition. So if you take the United States compared to, say, France, where individual employers are not paying for health insurance because that's provided centrally, it takes that outside of their balance sheet in thinking about the costs of, now, they still has to be paid for somehow, okay? So this is not, it's not a free system. It obviously comes out of another sort of uh, taxation system. But the point is on the margin, there's a lot of discussion about how uh, both the rise of uh, health uh, care costs in the United States and the fact that our primary system is one that ties it to the employer actually decreases our, competi our competitiveness um, um, internationally, which is super important, I think. I had a question about the uh, chart that was uh, shown about the uh, differences between um, Medicare Part A B and D. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like the, the bar chart for Medicare A shows that the government is supporting um, almost all of that. The other two, though, it, it, it was obviously less. So do you think that there should, should be some changes in, uh, in Part A to rescue uh, Medicare from any kind of a disaster in the years ahead? I think that the, the I'll reframe your, your comment. I think the point is that part A, you pay this premium. And so that, you've got the payroll tax plus the premium, so it's a little bit more self-supporting. Um, and as Henry had pointed out, the real outlier there is the new prescription drug benefits that were introduced um, uh, under Bush that were completely unfunded uh, from the current uh, system. So that the default, of course, is general taxes. It's all, it's all government. So the question is, which pocket is it coming out of? Um, and it's, it, there's quite a lot of differences across the different pieces, uh, just because of the way the financing works. Right here? Question over here. Uh, my question concerns the um, willowing or winnowing of the middle class as the 1% um, on that last chart gets much higher on their earnings up to close to 25% right now. Um, and then we've also seen that the poor has been going up with so the shrinking of the middle class. Yeah. What type of policies would you see that could um, work to strengthen the middle class again? I mean, uh, you saw what happened to those marginal tax rates on the super rich, and that's a I think that's a big part of the story. Um, the Bush tax cuts were not good for deficits in the United States, and they were not good for inequality in the United States. And so that's the where other I would thing start. Is to invest in education. Yeah, absolutely. Put more into K through 12, more into higher education. <laughs> and, I, and I'll just add just to, to, uh, to echo this, the point made about the state and local areas. That's one of the biggest employers that, and it's not the biggest employer that supports the middle class, but it's an important piece of it. Um, without, you know, uh, advanced degree, uh, the good, you know, the well-paying jobs that have historically been well-paying sort of outside the manufacturing sector, uh, pretty high up on that list are 
teachers and uh, you know police officers and a lot of these folks that are kind of squarely um, in that kind of hollowed out center right now. And part of that is is uh, is falling support and at, at in many states, anyways. Also indirectly, just more and better infrastructure investments would probably make it easier for industry uh, to prosper because a lot of industries are having troubles getting goods to market because of bad transportation systems. So things like that could really help. Do you have another? Yes. Yes, uh, we're talking about how the 1% is you know, becoming richer and richer and richer. And they're doing it at the loss of basically the 99%. Are we going to see a day when there's going to be an adjustment in that? Because we're, it's getting more and more unbalanced and we've, we're, you know, it seems like we're having an aristocracy of wealth now that uh, we never had before. And they're taking their money and they're keeping it rather than investing it, which if they'd invest, perhaps there'd be more jobs, perhaps there'd be more economic growth. It's, what, what, what do we have to do to, to stimulate that 1% to put their money on the line and, and help basically help society? Sibel, do you have a historical answer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think part of the reason things changed in the Great Depression, unfortunately, is that things were so bad for so long. So you know the great you know the stock market crashes in October of 1929, and there's no real federal intervention uh, into the economy until 1933, until FDR actually enters office. So that's three long years of no support from the federal government, unemployment at incredibly high rates, and so the people got really upset. They had a long time. There was no unemployment insurance. They'd lost all their savings. There's no FDIC insurance. There was no social security. There was there was nothing for them. Um, and this caused mass uh, protest in the streets. Elderly people organized, millions of them organized to push the federal government to get social security. Um, the veterans you know, marched on Washington to get a, an advance on their bonus checks. Millions of unemployed people, the labor movement was much stronger um, than it is now. It, it was rejuvenated during this period. And so I mean, that's that makes me a little bit of a cynic because that, that seems to require kind of a lot of pain before you get people to rise up. I mean, I think the Occupy movement was a start in that direction, um, but we haven't heard very much from Occupy in a while. Right here. You've uh, given us a lot of great analysis of takers viewed as those on welfare and those kind of programs. Aren't takers also, um, oil companies that get subsidies. Uh, I don't know if ag is still in it. Uh, I want to mention all the, all the misfeasance, malfeasance, and skullduggery of financial institutions and insurance companies that got bailed out and then turned around and you hear salty comments from the CEOs of Wells Fargo and B of A of how they hate regulation. So aren't they takers also? I got nothing to add. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and then I can't help but interject a point. Uh, Hillary, you mentioned uh, the point about health care costs going up. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, you know, there's not enough focus in our society on the externalities that come from misplaced policies. So, for example, we talk about supersizing at McDonald's and the obesity rates in this country and diabetes and the like. I don't know if this is an answer, but I, I'm a believer in a soda tax. I think it makes a lot of sense. Soda taxes don't pass. Now, why do they not pass? Because Coca-Cola and the like will put tens of millions of dollars up to defeat it. And it's a, so it's a question of where there's really no level playing field to debate some of these issues. So I'll throw up my thing is I feel an answer going forward is social media. It's, the social media is the only way where people can be mobilized to go against such a massive concentration of a, you know, in a, a certain interest group, just the, the leverage they have from economic resources. Yep. Yeah, my question is about, I guess, the framework of makers or takers. I think it's easy to talk about, you know, 1% versus the 99 or the, you know, evil oil companies versus everybody else. But what about the, 
you know, the vast swath of our middle class population in our state especially that has their taxes just frozen in time for forever um, against everybody else who's young and poorer. So like how, where does that come into play, mm -hmm. that makers versus takers? Talking about Prop 13, I think. Mm -hmm. Ah. Yeah. Well, that's a whole, that's a, that's a whole nother conversation, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that the, the important, I think the fact I've, you know, I could have uh, put in triple the figures I had in my, I talk, I, one thing that's very compelling to me is just looking at what's happening to median family income in the United States, and it's essentially gone down or stayed the same since 1973. Median, right? That's the middle. Um, so that's just a data point that's describing what, you know, we've sort of a lot of attention to the top and the bottom, and there's kind of a big forgetting of the middle where most mm -hmm. of us are. Um, and there's, there's, if anything, uh, sort of trending down there. Thank you. Uh, simple question. In the charts that were provided with uh, income distribution and marginal tax rates, the 1970s, as you just referenced, is when it, it seems to diverge. Yeah. What happened then? I just forget. Yeah. <laughs> This business starts to organize in a way that they have never done before, and conservatives start to organize in a way that they've never done before. They feel they're under attack by the Nixon administration, and they decide that it's time to kind of pool their resources and, and, make sh and start uh, lobbying at, in Washington and in all of the state legislatures across the country to have their interests better represented. Uh, this starts in the, they start talking about this in the early 1970s, and it's by the late 1970s that they really start to change. Um, conservative foundations start uh, funding conservative think tanks. Many of the think tanks in the United States are officially nonpartisan. They're just trying to provide the best data. But a lot of conservatives have been funding and been very good at funding partisan think tanks that are meant to shape the public debate and frame all of these ideas and, and, and talk about it in terms of makers and takers. And they're very good at it. And the, an example is the Heritage Foundation, which basically really doesn't do research. It just finds a way to always take the Republican position and find a justification for it. On the other hand, there's the American Enterprise Institute, which is a conservative think tank, which does some pretty darn good research, and Brookings, which is on the left. But unfortunately, we have a lot of these think tanks now, which are really nothing more than public relations firms mm -hmm. for a particular point of view. Uh, another point that I'd like to add to that is that one of the things that started to change, 1978 was Prop 13, and both with property taxes in California and with taxes at the federal level, the proportion paid by corporations has dropped dramatically. Um, in California with Prop 13, um, businesses either, you know, property does not turn over nearly as fast when it's owned commercially, and when it is turned over, they're very good at finding ways of making it look like it did not change right. ownership. Mm -hmm. So the proportion of taxes paid in California by corporations went down a lot. The same is true uh, at the federal level with corporate taxes. And I think that's a part of the inequality issue. Um, you know, uh, more of the money is controlled by corporations. Well, and who controls who gets the money from corporations? You know, the, the, the people who own large quantities of stocks and the people who run those corporations get to decide who gets that money. And one of the things they're doing is distributing it to themselves, basically. So I think that's another piece of um, you know, the inequality puzzle. The one piece of Prop 13 that might be vulnerable, because the truth is Californians love Proposition 13 for a variety of reasons, but the one piece is the fact that the corporate uh, roles are linked right now to personal roles. And you could maybe delink them and say that we should reassess them much more often. And there's some public support for that, and people are trying to push forward with the idea that we might change that. And one of the things that happened with Prop 13 is the ratio uh, between the amount of money raised on the personal property tax rolls versus the corporation property tax rolls essentially reversed. So that now the corporations pay a lot less of the total than do the personal. And, and I, I, let me just add that it might surprise many of you in this room that the United States collects much more of its income tax from the, from the corporate sector than our competitors do. Mm -hmm. So it's actually pretty, you know, there's a lot of evidence that we might do better at moving away from the corporate income tax. And California actually collects more in the corporate income tax relative to its tax base compared to its competitors, other, if, other states, if you think of it that way. So it's the, the corporate piece is a little bit, 
a little bit, I mean, I agree with you about the inequality, but I think if you think about the importance of job growth, which that's a really important piece of trying to keep revenues high and deciding what to do with them, that piece is not an unimportant one in terms of, uh, again, the sort of international uh, competitiveness. Okay, is there a take... big difference between the nominal tax rate? My understanding is that the yes. real tax rate yes. And that, and that gets back to the comment about, you know, there's, there's a lot of takers, and there's a lot of takers in the intricacies of the tax code. So yes, you're absolutely right, and it sort of gets back to the, you know, Exxon pays zero, and, and right, so it's the nominal versus effective tax. But still, even if you look at the aggregate um, uh, corporate income tax dollars compared to all dollars taken in, it's higher in the U.S. than, than uh, our competitors. Okay. we're. Getting towards the end of our time, I'll take one last question here, and then I'll ask the panelists if they have any final words of wisdom for us as we, <laughs> we go off. Right here. Well, I was going to point out, uh, recently heard uh, David Stockman speaking here mm. in book. Right. And one of the... Uh, Please use the mic. That'd be great. Thanks. One of his premises is that we should not have banks that are too big to fail. Mm. And then he said... <laughs> <laughs> The bank's response is that they can't compete with the European banks if that's not the case. And he said, we're really not competing with them because they are government subsidized, apparently, in, in Europe, the large banks. And so our banks end up being subsidized by the taxpayers because of the quote unquote too big to fail situation. What policy, how, you know, what is your thoughts on that? Well, yeah. I'd say, first of all, the studies that have looked at economies of scale in banking suggest that you don't have to be as big as a lot of the banks are now. These are mostly vanity projects. And they're, and they're more than that, actually. They're also power projects. The bigger you get, the more powerful you get. And you can become too big to fail. And then you've got a lot of leverage. So in fact, there's a lot of people across the political spectrum. George Will and Bob Reich together on This Week with George Stephanopoulos one morning, both of them agreed that we should get rid of banks that are too big to fail. It was a sort of marvelous, wonderful moment. <laughs> <laughs> OK, would you, each of you like to make a final comment, or do you feel you've expressed your points of view? I would just say, if only the whole world had uh, the kind of engaging, questioning, uh, knowledgeable base of information as Berkeley did, we would all be in a much better place. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. I, I, I would ask if maybe the panelists could stay for a few minutes up here. If anyone has a specific question they'd like to ask, sure. please come up to the front. And I'm willing to talk about climate change. <laughs> anything we uh, he's gone. Anything we're do. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Very great. <laughs> Very great. Thank you, Dick, for your inspired moderating and our ASUC president. Thank you, Dean Brady, our rock star political scientist, and <laughs> Professor Fox, Professor Hoynes. How fabulous to have woman power with us today for your stimulating insight and for sharing your expertise on this busy Saturday. And thank you, Lynn Serta Price, the Goldman School, Annette Dornbus. And our class volunteers, especially Peter Munoz and Jane LaRoe, Bob Wong, Jesse Ante, and Selma. I don't know if Selma had arrived. And more for making today happen. And thank all of you for your interest in what we're here to do and learn about. And to make sure this happens again, please, we would appreciate your help. And take the flyer that is available and learn how you can support the centers work towards solving public policy problems. Thank you so much. Thank you.